shapeshifters hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? everyone, and welcome back to a Time Shifters podcast. This is your host, Christopher. With me, as always, is my co-host, Tom. Tom, how the heck have you been? Oh, it's just wonderful as we record on Valentine's Day. <laughs> yeah, give, a, give everybody a little insight to our recording schedule. <laughs> sure, why not? That's right. That's what we had to do for Valentine's Day. <laughs> Because we, because we love you. Yes, all. we're bringing the love to you. The inventor of pop tarts died, Tom. Oh, man, you don't even tell a man to sit down, and you're gonna break that kind of news. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, that just happened today. That... As we record, uh, William Post, ninety-six years old. He lived a long, sounds like a really great life, and you know he brought us pop tarts. Man. Man's a genius, an icon. Yeah, absolutely. Do you do you actually do you partake in the pop tart uh, every, occasionally? Every once in a while, especially in the fall, I'm prone to get a good uh, pumpkin pop tart every now and then. Oh, sure, the seasonal stuff. Seasonal stuff's great. Uh, I, I mean, I I do love. Uh, uh, I don't get them on the regular because I mean, we're not yeah. getting any younger, and they're not good for you. But no, nope. <laughs> but. I gotta tell you, there is one that I continue to this day to miss. It was the Spider-Man Pop Tart. <laughs> <laughs> the fruit filling was really good, but the the, the icing on the front um, it was barely Spider-Man themed. It kind of looked like a web. It had some of the the blue and the red in there, but I don't know why it was both fun and flavorful. So <laughs> I miss the Spider-Man Pop Tart. I don't think I ever had a Spider-Man tart, Pop Tart. Well, at this stage, since they're not available, no, yeah, that then you, you can't know the sorrow that I feel. Okay, here's here's the question, though. Do you have a go-to flavor, and toasted or untoasted? Always toasted. Always. Mm, always. Interesting. Yes. No. I got to get that caramelization on the icing on the top. Okay. Um, and, and then. I'm pretty pretty solid on like strawberry. Like that's that's a good go to, especially with the little sprinkles on the frosting, and then they get all caramelized. It's good stuff. All right, yeah. I am. Um, my go to is the frosted cherry. Frosted cherry. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Which I eat untoasted. Untoasted, really. But should I have the classic brown sugar cinnamon? Yes. I prefer that unfrosted and toasted interesting <laughs> well I, I always knew you were an odd duck but uh <laughs> but really unfrosted yeah. yeah yeah it seems sacrilegious i i don't know i something about the frosting i just you know i can i can take or leave it i'd rather not have it on my brown sugar cinnamon and, and, and he, that was always the funny thing for me with the, the Pop-Tarts is uh, flavors that I thought I would like, I don't tend to like in a Pop-Tart. So the brown sugar cinnamon, not bad, but it's it's not, not a go-to. I love those flavors. They don't work for me in the Pop-Tart so much. Same deal with the chocolate ones. Like uh, Those actually are off-putting completely, and I am a chocolate fanatic. Right. So yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't do those. I like the the, the fruit ones yes. or the brown sugar cinnamon. But frosted cherry is my. I actually I have a box of frosted cherry that I uh, upstairs right now. It's the first box of pop tarts I have, quote unquote, bought yeah. in years, and I only got them because I was at the checkout. Yeah. And someone left their coupons that print out at the register. Yeah. And it was for a free box of pop tarts. <laughs> Well, so I was like, well, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, why would, why would you not get a free box of Pop-Tarts? Exactly. So I have a free uh, nine-pack or whatever it is of 
pop tart of, of frosted cherry pop tarts. Now, now uh, he invented the thing, and obviously there have been lots of knockoffs, uh, including store brands and all that. Have you ever sure, ventured the toaster out? strudels and things toaster, like that? Yeah, toaster strudel was always a nice. I want to say I tried like some store brand mm-hmm. uh, pop tart once. It was probably a, a Kroger brand or something like that. I buy pop tarts if I'm going to buy pop tarts. That is, that is fair, uh, but yeah, no, that actually was one of those things that where, especially the seasonal stuff, the pumpkin ones that I, I like, Pop Tart brand w- was pretty good, but honestly, Target did it better. Really? Oh, really? interesting. Oh, okay. So, oh, speaking of um, flavors that don't exist anymore, at least I haven't found them in ages for a while, several years ago, and it, it is probably a good thing that they don't exist or I can't find them because I was buying the hell out of them. They had red velvet pop tarts. Really? I don't know if I ever knew that. Oh my God. They were so good. <laughs> oh, man, I was, I was kind I kept getting like, it was one of those things where you get a coupon. Yeah. Like, oh, I'll buy one. And then you just, it's like, you know, the first hits free. <laughs> <laughs> I was buying them left and right and like anywhere I could find a coupon or, or oh, they're on sale. Three, buy three, get one free. <laughs> See, for me, the red velvet anything, and I didn't know that there was a Pop-Tart one, so I might have to, if I ever find that, I'll have to try that, especially since my son tends to like red velvet. But I find red velvet is a diminishing return kind of thing. That first one can be good. Red velvet, whatever. That can be good, but if you go to have the second and then the third, and like, I'm not getting as much love as I did on that uh, first taste. The love never diminished for me on those. I, I really enjoyed them. And that, that was years ago, five, ten years ago, when yeah. those were around that I that I found them. And I, I haven't seen them since. And, yeah, if believe me, if they would show up again... I, <laughs> might be in trouble i have to take up jogging or something (laughs) yeah i was gonna say maybe the fact that they went away is why you're here today (laughs) (laughs) i'll be i'll be i'll be running and eating a red velvet (laughs) that's a funny picture to think of (laughs) you know we talk a lot on this show about physical media versus streaming yes and we're very aware of your stance (laughs) 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 <laughs> <laughs> well here's a little bit of uh some evidence uh, to why you should all be on my side of this <laughs> argument uh the streaming service funimation mm-hmm. which uh, a lot of people went to for some a lot of their uh, anime and uh, animated stuff and everything yep that's shutting down yeah uh they're moving all their content to crunchyroll yeah but here's the thing crunchyroll is not honoring any purchases you made on Funimation. So if you bought a series or a film on Funimation, yeah, it's gone. Tough luck. It's a great way to drive off business. <laughs> Usually when one buys something else, especially a service kind of thing, you usually have to kind of pick up you have to grandfather in the folks that you're now getting as customers because you bought the service. And yeah. Now, now Funimation is being very nice and just actually migrating all their existing customers to a crunchy roll. Yeah. This is, this is going to happen in April of this year, by the way, April of 24. So they are nice. They're going to migrate the, your customers over, but yes, all your purchases are null and void. And there, of course, there is no real discussion about what's the cost uh, for the consumer, is how much is that going to change now that they're on Crunchyroll? Uh, so, yeah, there's going to be a lot of wow. um, back and forth on that. Yeah, no, that's that's terrible. Uh, so, like, yeah, I feel, but uh, y- y- you make you make a strong case. <laughs> Streaming services, I think, are awesome. They are. You know, they, they have, a, truly, they have a, a place in our entertainment uh, world nowadays. But if you're going to buy something, buy the damn disc. No, that's fair. Uh, yeah, because that was 
that was the caveat for me to go to streaming services on the whole. Um, I remember back in the day when I was buying physical media all the time that I always insisted on buying the physical media that also got you the downloadable content. Mm -hmm. and, and then I maintain the account that has downloadable content and it's always available that way. I don't have to pull out the DVD, but then I can watch the show. But as I transitioned away from buying that, I, I took on the whole, okay, instead of me storing stuff, I am going to belong to a service now, but I'm not going to have to buy anything else. Like I'm not buying things to keep anymore. I'm just accepting that things will ebb and flow. But as we discussed even off air before we started, there is now this, between that, that whole Funimation to Crunchyroll thing and every streaming service's desire to add more revenue to the thing by just adding ads on top of your existing, and they don't seem to get how, how and where to place their ads with the content that they've made available. They're ruining the experience of even having the convenience of having streaming. That's exactly what's happening to me. Yes. Uh, I mean, I was a late adopter to actually having a stream streaming services in the house uh, outside of uh, Amazon Prime. And so was, we finally, quote unquote, cut the cable. Yep. And so I got things like Paramount Plus and we still have Prime and I thought I'd be watching Paramount Plus. I thought this was going to be, you're never going to see me again kind of experience because I was going to, all my Star Treks are going to be there. But the poorly placed ads in the shows truly has kind of ruined the experience for me. So unless I want to double up and pay twice as much to get the ad-free version, and how long how long will that last before there is no ad-free version? Right. Uh, I, I'm just, I'm out of luck. And so now I'm thinking I will probably not renew. I mean, I paid for a year because that was the cheapest way to go. I may at this point not renew and just put that money towards the Blu-rays of the series that I want. <laughs> right. No, the thing, uh, and this is all about the timing of this moment too, um, because I, I'm a fan of uh, Pluto TV as a streaming source. Um, they have recently, they, they've, uh, they've changed their logo slightly, um, and they've released some new of their own advertising for their streaming service on their service and they own what they are. Um, so they are essentially going, we're basically cable only we're free. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, you're going to have ads, but you're going to have the entire catalog of what we have. You're going to have our channels, which get very specific so whichever rabbit hole you want to disappear down, we're going to help you disappear down that role. Uh, and then on top of it, we have we have downloadable content. We have uh, on-demand content. That, and all of it's free. You will get ads. But we aren't expecting anything else from you. So they are really owning that whole, yes, everybody's doing ads, but we're not charging you to be here in the first place. So... Mm -hmm. Nice. So, uh, like, That's, they're taking it, advantage of the moment. It's a little bit how I feel about Tubi. Yeah. Tubi, there's no, you don't have to pay anything for Tubi. You can, they got all kinds of, and it's a fantastic place for someone like your, myself that likes kind of some of the more odd films mm -hmm. and, and hard to find films. I mean, they, they come up with some incredible things that never found anywhere else. You'd never find on Prime or anything. It's going to be on Tubi. And the ads, they do right. They actually put them, they put them in the right in the spots. spot, right where they belong. <laughs> They're not before the ad break. They're not five seconds after where the ad break should be. I mean, they're right where they need to be. And the experience, it, that's fine. I can live with that. That's okay. I'll mute the TV, you know, maybe. Or that's when I'm going to go up and get something to, from the refrigerator and come back just like the old days. And I'm fine. And I'll watch my show. My experiences with things like Paramount Plus, who can't put an ad in the right place to save their damn life. They had a new customer who's going to, they're going to lose this customer. I feel like at some point we should have like a generational interview 
Because think about all the uh, the kids oh, that that have been growing up during the what we're gonna have to now refer to as the golden age of streaming, where mm -hmm. where you bought the service and you had the wealth of their library nonstop, no ads, no nothing. And think about all the people now that are going to have to be reintroduced to the concept of a commercial. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those of us that grew up with it as kids, as it transitions to this, we're pissed off that you want us to pay for your service and then watch your ads. But we're used to the ads. <laughs> yeah, it's a step backwards for sure. It absolutely is, which is why those free services that at least own who they are, they're refreshing. They're like... Yes, this is exactly what you watched before, only you can get a little more niche than you used to be able to. Um, so, but no, I think it'd be fun to just talk to various people throughout their age ranges to figure out how, how are you dealing with entertainment these days? <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what have you been up to? Um, the big one, uh, like we talked before the show, was... Uh, um, with the uh, ads that have all been out, the Super Bowl did its thing and all that. And I had known that this film was coming out even before the new Super Bowl ad. But uh, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes is due out in a couple weeks. Um, yeah, the trailer looks fantastic. It, it does. And it, it reminded me um, that not only had it been a while since I saw any of the newer version of the Planet of the Apes, but I never got around to watching War for the Planet of the Apes. So I didn't get to see the third in the series. And my son was interested in it, so we actually binge-watched that a couple weeks ago. And I gotta say, uh, well, as much as I, I was a fan of the originals, these were really good. Uh, I mean, the... The effects of the apes and all that, and since they are apes, they, these are actual real animals. At some point, it actually is real animals, but their CGI of the animals, too, is super impressive. And, of course, Andy Serkis uh, and his ability to do the uh, motion capture work as well as act through all of it is, is always amazing. So his portrayal of Caesar throughout the, the series was just, it, it really hit. And, and the fact that you're seeing, like we saw people in ape costumes with a decent mask in the seventies. Right. Seeing the actual ape and, and, and watching its head move and all that, it, it's clear from the very first one, the, the rise of the planet of the apes, that one's a little more dated. There's a couple of times, especially in a 4K environment, you can pick up some flaws. But those flaws quickly leave as the uh, franchise goes on. Well, that was 2011, I think I saw. So, I mean, it was over a decade ago. Oh, so, yeah. yeah te technology has definitely grown since then. Well, yeah, because, I mean, that that was some of the more groundbreaking even uh, of the time for that uh, motion capture stuff, especially the facial features on a mm -hmm. human being posed into something CGI. So it is very effective, but I mean, it's really good storytelling, very good acting. And interestingly enough, because I was watching it through a Plex server and the way the Plex um, will split off subtitles, if you don't turn them on, one of the things that happens in in the Planet of the Apes movies, uh, to give it a lot of authenticity, is most of the apes sign. Mm, um, yeah. Even as they're evolving and maturing and growing in, in, in intellect, their primary language is sign language. So I forgot about turning on the subtitle feature and had to just kind of gauge what they were saying because i'm not I, i'm not an asl expert so so but i understand some of the signs especially the, as many as they would have an ape might have had so I, I i could fake my way through the first film but i'm like oh wait they're talking a lot more in the second <laughs> one <laughs> and, and, and it's all hand gestures like damn it okay we gotta turn that on but but that's what what makes it so really cool and it makes the moments when apes speak 
um, that it ha- holds more gravitas. Sure. So, yeah, I we were talking before we recorded, and it, it, I never got around to watching uh, the new trilogy of films, not for any reason other than I literally just never got around to them. Um, I really feel like after seeing this uh, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, which looked, the trailer looked really good. Yeah. And for no other reason, I'm just looking at like the background and the set pieces of this world, and I'm a sucker for that post-human uh, civilization using things not as they were intended. Yeah, you know, and the world uh, reclaiming. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a huge sucker for that kind of stuff. Uh, so that alone makes me want to see this film. And so if any of that plays into the first three films as well, then I I really feel like I've probably cheated myself by not watching them. So I I'll, I'll, will probably try to pick them up and uh, binge them sometime soon. Yeah, I, I highly recommend it. And uh, uh, as I also described, worth rewatching maybe at least a couple of key movies from the originals uh, because they're rife with Easter eggs that just make you go... That's not that like some of the basic lines. You get your damn dirty ape <laughs> line in there somewhere. It's not where you expect it to show up. <laughs> so, nice. So. That's cool. Yeah, you don't have to twist my arm very hard to get me to watch any of the original films. I mean, I know. they are not. I think you have to really separate. There are the '70s films, mm-hmm. and then there they are the 2010s. Right. films however you want to say it they are not i mean you that's apples and oranges uh, <laughs> when it comes to the, the types of films that they are but uh i do really enjoy that original uh four or five films no i yeah and th- those are a lot of fun and i was so thrilled to see them definitely pay homage to to that and, and in ways that made sense like it wasn't just it wasn't just lip service. It wasn't just for fans. It, it it fit where it fit. So they took what they needed out of that to help mold the direction they wanted to go. And since the first three films of this series are literally uh, the the birth and the rise of Caesar as as an intellectual um, equal, if not potential superior to human. Um, so watching him evolve that way, especially in the first film where you see him as a, a, from the day he was born, um, to the time that he leaves his human family and the circumstances for which that actually happens, the amount of emotion that they managed to capture in, in, in a chimpanzee that wasn't really there was just impressive. I, I can't say enough about it. All right, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I'll, I definitely feel like I've probably done myself a disservice, so I'll I will uh, I'll catch up as as quickly as I can. Well, look at it this way: you now get to sit with that trilogy, and you can finish it out in a sitting, as opposed to. The years, because there were big, there <laughs> were huge have to wait a decade and a half. <laughs> yeah, I don't have to wait a decade and a half. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, like, uh, I, I when the first after the first one, I think the second one came out only about two years or so later. A reasonable amount of time for a sequel, but War for the Planet of the Apes was almost another five or six. It was long wait to get to that one. Right. So, but again, that one too was also worth its weight um and woody harrelson is, is one of the uh, actors in that film playing a human element um and he was outstanding uh and Sweet. not a character that you will like but you will sympathize with <laughs> nice yes yeah awesome um I'm trying to think if there was any other trailers that i saw coming out of the super bowl uh, Kingdom for the Planet of the Apes. There was another one that was... Uh, oh, there's the Deadpool. <laughs> that's the one I was going to say. Yeah, the, the Deadpool and Wolverine. Um, I, apparently, I really need to go back and watch, like, Loki or something to understand what the hell is going on. Yeah, they're going to heavily influence the TVA um, from the Loki series in order to tell this story and to 
it, it, it'll be an entertaining way to merge Sony's Marvel Universe with the actual MCU. Yeah, that's what I understand they're kind of doing is using this as a bridge to finally pull in the two uh, the two franchises, I guess, into one again. And this is where Marvel will launch its next phase, too, because this is where, um, well, like, there was the announcement of the Fantastic Four cast. Yes. Um, so this is where we'll lead into the Fantastic Fours, and we'll probably actually see new X-Men material in the not-too-distant future. That'll be interesting. I actually really liked uh, First Class and its sequel. Oh, and since we just happened to discuss the the X-Men and the Sony universe for for all of this, um, just coincidentally, uh, of all things, uh, I was getting a haircut and somebody was running the very first X-Men movie uh, with Patrick Stewart and all that. And now, granted... We watched Patrick Stewart in the late 80s, early 90s as Captain Picard and all that. So, I mean, he looked young, uh, as young as he did for a bald guy (laughs) then. But, I mean, even in the chair in the first movie, I'm like, he looks so damn young. And Ian McKellen even looked like he was old in the film and he was looked like crazy young. And like, oh my God, how old is this film? Yeah, you realize how long ago those movies were. Oh my god, yes. No, it was insane. Anna Paquin's an actual child. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a little it can be a little disturbing. Yeah, cuz I have a hard time thinking that that was as long ago as it was. Yeah. Yeah, you don't like to think about that. But no, that was 99. Yeah. So 25 years ago. Yeah, so, yeah, that's why Patrick Stewart... <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, looks... I, I totally get it, but I'm like, wait, was, was that, wasn't that only, like, 10 years ago? No. No. <laughs> 25. You know, yeah. half of my life. <laughs> yeah, what was the meme about uh, people, when people our age think about sci-fi from 25 years ago, and they think of, like, the Battlestar Galactica. Yeah, the original. What, what it really was, DS9. Yeah. <laughs> no! If you're going 25 years ago, it's actually Enterprise. Yeah. <laughs> DS9 it was, probably, was 30. <laughs> it was probably, yeah, it was probably an old meme. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> but yes, no, we're feeling our age. But yeah, that, that was a fun little thing. So, but... All, all that said, I'm definitely looking forward to the third Deadpool movie. I already really liked that, and I'm a I'm a fan of Ryan Reynolds. I enjoy him immensely, even when he's in crap. <laughs> Preface this: Did you see the popcorn cup for the Dune movie? Yes, yes, I did. All right, so you saw that going around. Uh huh. <laughs> so after the Deadpool Wolverine trailer came out uh-huh. on a. Uh, I think it was on Twitter or something like that. Ryan Reynolds, his his post, wait till you see our popcorn bucket. <laughs> <laughs> I think I did catch that. <laughs> Which is funny because actually here in the room with me, I have some overpriced popcorn containers from movies because I've got an Optimus Prime head and an Optimus Prime trailer. <laughs> <laughs> the smokestacks are straws. Yeah, anything else? No. All right, yeah, me either. I don't have anything else. Uh, So let's go ahead and take a short break here. We'll listen to a promo for another podcast. And when we get back, we're going to take a look at 2005's The Island. Give a damn what you think you are entitled to. Hey, 
I'm entitled to see movies that don't suck. I would tell anybody outside the family what you're thinking again. I was not expecting that. After you've scrubbed all the floors in Hyrule, then we can talk about mercy. Take him away. No! We are going to die. <laughs> yeah. My ship sails in the morning. I wonder what's for dinner. It's a jacked up review show. It's a jacked up review show. Jacked up review show. It's a jacked up review show. Join your host, Cam Sully, each week as he chats with special guests to discuss many an insane movie and numerous cult TV phenomenons. To the lottery spin. Jordan to Delta. You're moving out to the island. Transported to the world's last paradise. I think they're gonna kill you. I'm going to the island. There is no island! Come on! Two of our products have escaped. Run! Do not let him get away! What was that? I don't know! But I want one. This summer. Tell me what's going on! They're gonna come looking for you! Good job! You're copies of people. So one of them gets sick and they need a new part, they take it from you. No! I'm sorry, I'm not ready to die. From Michael Bay. How come I never did this before? The director of The Rock and Armageddon. Well, that tongue thing is amazing. I know you're new to this whole human thing, but backpacks for boys, purses for girls. Understand? We're not idiots. Well, excuse me, miss. I'm so smart, I can't wait to go to the island. Ewan McGregor. I just want to live. I don't care how. Scarlett Johansson. Don't draw me like it! You still think there's an island? The Island is a sci-fi action film directed by Michael Bay, and it stars Ewan McGregor and Scarlett Johansson. In the film, Lincoln Six Echo lives in a peaceful but structured community. The inhabitants are told that the outside world has become too contaminated to support life outside of the compound, except for a place called The Island. Every week a lottery is held, and one of the inhabitants gets to leave to live their life on this Eden-like island. When Lincoln begins to have dreams of experiences he knows he has not had, he begins to question his surrounding and explores beyond the confines of the facility. What he discovers shatters his world and uncovers the dark truth of his and his friend's existence. The creators of the 1979 film Parts the Clonus Horror, which is about a community of clones living in a desert facility that are used for organ harvesting for their elite originals, filed a copyright infringement suit in 2005. DreamWorks attempted to have the suit dismissed, but a federal judge ruled that there was a case to be heard. The trial was to be held in 2007, but DreamWorks settled the case out of court for an undisclosed seven-figure amount. <laughs> I don't know how any lawyer of DreamWorks went to a judge and said, no, this is completely different. (laughs) (laughs) Other than the total plot. (laughs) Uh, There was also a novel published in 1996 called Spares with a very similar theme that was actually optioned by DreamWorks in the late 90s, but was never uh, produced. The author of the novel, Michael Marshall Smith, however, did not pursue any legal actions. Yeah, it's not a um, unfamiliar story, no. I suppose. Yeah. No, the, the parts of the Clonus Horror, if anyone's not seen it, uh, if you don't want to actually try your hand at the at the 79 film, uh, the, the pure 1979 film, you can find it on Mystery Science Theater 3000. Yes, they, you can. Uh, <laughs> they did an episode on it. It is a, a fairly good one. Now, this was the first time I'd watched this film in quite a while, probably not since the first time, you know, sometime soon after it came to home media. Uh, You, on the other hand, if I remember correctly, last time said you've seen this film quite a few times. I have, yeah. Uh, I seem to recall, I I saw this in the theater. Um, 
and then yes, uh, I I I catch it. Like I don't go out of my way to catch it on the regular, but depending on where it may appear, it is one that I will just stop and pop on. I I, I can enjoy this almost any time, and I am saying that knowing full well that this is a Michael Bay film. <laughs> <laughs> Because I have great disdain for Mr. Bay. <laughs> I think he was disappointed at how few things he could get to explode in this film. Yeah, and uh, we'll get into it more when we get into the reviews, but I did have somebody actually point out, this is two films. Okay, explain. E- easily done. Uh, you have the first half of the film, which is all about the world in the compound. And it's very, uh, there, there's a mystery element to there. There's this intrigue, thriller. Um, there is the heavy sci-fi overtones of what's happening, especially as they evolve through the process of figuring out what they are. And then after the initial escape, it goes into full bore action film. We almost don't give a crap about everything that happened before, and it is all about the chase. Yeah, you're right. This really is a movie of, like, two acts. Absolutely. And that's the problem, is it's two acts. (laughs) We don't really get a proper and satisfying third. (laughs) No, you get get one hour of buildup. Yep. And one hour of conclusion. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh, yeah and, and there there are a lot uh, and, and i am saying this as a film i enjoy i i enjoy the uh, i enjoy the overall story trying to be told i enjoy the action i enjoy uh um the actors that were in there and it's actually kind of fun to see ewan mcgregor and scarlett johansson again this earlier in their career um because they come off very nubile in this, which is, which is perfect for what they were playing too. Mm-hmm. Um, so it all really kind of fits, but there are some giant gaping holes and some huge leaps of faith in, in this film as you watch it. No, no, absolutely. Uh, Michael Bay talking about him as a director yeah he kind of is known for the the director that's going to blow something up and this film of course is not doesn't shy away from that but he also seems to think that he is occasionally an artur and so he tries to be artsy and tries to be you know uh, do something strange and odd and the problem is it just it doesn't fit it never fits you either have to the dream sequence is what I'm getting at. Yeah. In the very beginning of the film, you have the dream sequence with Ewan McGregor, and it's all very surreal and, and, and weird. And then the rest of the film isn't like that. It feels so incongruous with the rest of the movie. And not to kind of oversell the point on the dream, but there are things that happen in the dream that have nothing to do with what happens any further in the film and i'm referring to like there are guys that pop up and start uh drowning him and and such and he mentions later to the doctor that that in his dreams he drowns but he doesn't mention that he's attacked and there's no element of that and it's so it's it's sat weird for me it's kind of like this this was completely disjointed from what we were going to do from then on out if we had seen just the flashes of the boat and his 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 dreamlike fantasy about the Scarlett Johansson character and, and cruising toward an island and left it at that. But the drowning part and the men dragging him down, that part didn't fit with his experiences, with his uh, sponsor's experiences, or or anything else to do with the movie. Yeah, I would have really preferred just flashes of what looked like memories mm-hmm. rather than some weird ass nightmare. I think it would have fit the uh, it would have fit the story better. This is where there's some misses involved. Um, for instance, that dream, regardless of the the nightmare component of it, but the notion of the flashes of memory, 
we are introducing the concept of clones that are that are grown to the same age as their sponsor before they're even brought out of their their growth membranes and all that birthed birthed um, and then introduced into the environment and I liked the explanation that the movie chose uh, to go about in order for these to be viable for the tissue to live the thing needs to live I, right. I, I kind of like that it, I mean I don't know that there's any science to any of that but it had a very nice spiritual ethereal feel that fit with what they were doing and then touching on the notion that something about the echo generation of of a product as they referred to them that something was different in this particular version of the cloning that memory transfer took place again don't know that there's any actual science to the notion that you could literally clone the path the memory pathways of a brain but the concept as a science fiction element is amazing we didn't really do a whole lot with that <laughs> no no it's it, it's a shame because the science of which they were growing in their clones never indicated that there should be any transfer of consciousness right. or memory from the from the uh, the host or whatever you want to call it the original the sponsor <laughs> the sponsor thank you it would have been more interesting had they just focused on the this clone is questioning he he's questioning his surroundings he he wants to rebel he he wants colors he he's not he's not content to just go with the program and that alone should have been enough to make the uh, the the owners of this facility start to question what's going on, and let them and, and then let uh, Echo Six investigate and and learn and 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 find out the truth. You didn't need the the dream or the the memory or or anything like that, except that it becomes a shorthand to like okay. We got to make it so when he gets out in the real world, he knows how to do things, and we have to have an explanation as to as to why. Yeah, and, and that's what I think also fails in where we jump into the giant leaps of faith that we take later. Um, I don't know that the flashes of memory were enough for me to be convinced that he could instantly be capable of so much more in the real world. Yeah. Especially when it came, and that's when it becomes uber fantastical, where these are essentially children. Mm -hmm. They even said they, they they're educated to a, a, a to the level of a fifteen year old, um, and none of them have been alive longer than like four years. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the notion that that um, Lincoln escapes. And can figure out how to drive things and, and work computers. <laughs> and then the extra incredulous part, not just drive things, but fly things. <laughs> and you're like, wait a minute, you're like five minutes old. <laughs> you know how to do this stuff. Just because you dreamed about a boat is not enough for me to believe you can now master the world you walk into five seconds after you've been in it. Yep. Nope. Exactly. Yeah. It, it doesn't really hold up. It is exactly like you said, it's fantastical. But what I want to get back to about the thought is where, again, missed opportunity and you are never going to get it from Michael Bay, the notion of an intellectual property and Michael Bay, they do not go together. Um, so wrong director for the possibilities here. This could have really gotten into the possibilities of, of the real ethics, not just the ethics of growing a clone for parts, but what does it mean to recreate yourself? And what, did, what makes up the self? And the notion that in whatever process they followed for this particular generation, they have managed to actually capture some of the essence of self from the original and put it into the clone. 
there's all sorts of cool stuff to explore there, but we weren't going to get that in this film. No, and I don't know if you could get it in a film. That is the kind of stuff That's we've talked material. about. <laughs> we've talked about it before that that is the type of stuff that would be best fit for a television. No, you or, need or long form story. storytelling to be able to do that. But the point yeah, is, exactly. is, it would be fascinating to go down that that route, and this was not the vehicle for that. <laughs> The other thing, since I brought up Michael Bay and not necessarily being the right person for the job for certain things, um, and you had mentioned earlier uh, his, his one, want for being an auteur, um, he does have elements that no matter what, no matter which film of his you ever watch, you'll get the same things. And it's it, one sits glaringly like with Scarlett Johansson. He likes his women to be slightly dirty, greasy looking, almost orange, and and he likes to shoot camera angles up everybody's nose. <laughs> I don't know if I'd noticed. Oh, no, I noticed that way too much. He likes the low down angle because uh, he wants to get that upshot of them looking in wonderment at whatever or whatever, but he uses it so often it becomes you could turn make a drinking game of it and you will be you will be blitzed by the end it be, it becomes a trope yeah uh, a little bit yeah so michael bay has his affectations and he sticks to them hard <laughs> <laughs> i know um and you may mention this some in your uh, in your reading of some of the the critics and everything but one of the criticisms of this film was the blatant consumer product placement <laughs> yeah and they are not wrong. No. I forgot. I mean, this film, it is so in your face. Almost every scene is effectively a commercial for some product, whether it's Puma, <laughs> Apple, Aquafina, uh <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, it happens. Cadillac, oh, my gosh. <laughs> it, it happens right out of the gate, too. We get out of that dream sequence, and we're into the drawers in his room with all the branded... uh the branded outfits and shoes. Yeah. And we still don't ever find out what happened to that left shoe. Yeah. No, no, I have no idea what happened to his, his one, his missing left shoe. <laughs> it's the, that's the sequel. Yeah. No, the, <laughs> the, the, the product placement was really, really heavy in this. I, it's amazing. When you watch a film like this and it is so blatant, you really learn to appreciate the fact that it happens. Product placement is in every movie and television show but you don't always you don't you don't really notice it when it's done right right this was not done right (laughs) wait you're telling me that michael bay doesn't know how to effectively use product placement in his stuff that's unthinkable transformers uh Yeah, you definitely get the impression that the reason this film was made at all was just from advertising dollars for them being allowed to put their product so front and center and in your face. And you expected people to actually turn to the camera. And I don't know about you, but the one thing this place does right, it's water. <laughs> it's- <laughs> Well, yeah, and, and which just makes me laugh more over the comment uh, of uh, Bay trying to be an auteur and, and then immediately launches into the commercial. Yeah. <laughs> like, got it, Michael. I know what you're here for, and it's dollar signs, dude. Yes. I'm an artist working for Puma. <laughs> Brought to you by... <laughs> Yeah, the new Cadillac. <laughs> yeah, the new Cadillac that we never saw. <laughs> yeah, we saw a, a concept car from uh, 2005. Yeah, uh, for their uh, that was for their I think hundredth anniversary. Yep. Uh, it was a pretty little car. I actually yeah. kind of liked it. Sure. Just never existed. Other no, than that. unfortunately not. <laughs> unfortunately not. But yeah, you could definitely see where a lot of the models that came thereafter had some inspiration from it. So no, and they stole as much inspiration from other supercars as they possibly could have. <laughs> yeah, right. that's true. Uh, I, it, hard to wa- watch that sequence and not picture Jeremy Clarkson laughing his ass off. <laughs> 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 
Cadillac, right. Got it. <laughs> he would have hated the doors. Oh, he would have absolutely hated the doors. Got to push the button and wait for him to... Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's waiting for that. <laughs> nope. <laughs> uh, one of the things that bothered me, and this was, again, you're talking about, you know, problems with the plot and things like this. And this is something I think this film did that worked, actually worked, mm -hmm. I think, a little bit better for parts the Clonus horror <laughs> versus the island. Yeah. The actual facility that they depict. Yeah is way too large to keep that thing a secret. You would think, Th yeah. They have literally like, look like 50 story towers, three towers mm -hmm. full of these clones, these people being serviced by, you know, they have guards, they have cafeteria workers, administrative uh, people. You, so you got to think there's hundreds, if not thousands of support staff right. at this facility. No one has a problem with them breaking the law and actually giving these clones consciousness. Right. No one says anything. No one accidentally mentions while they're drinking a beer at the local bar. Uh, no, that none of that ever happens. Yeah, Steve Buscemi's the closest thing to to skirting the line on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I just it doesn't hold any water whatsoever that they could keep this a secret no and and the part the figure you were missing is uh because scarlett johansson uh, says it at one point there's over a thousand clones in there yeah and then the support staff to keep a thousand clones alive not and that's only what scarlett johansson knew that's not all the ones that are pre-birth or pre uh, they, they call it the foundation sequence is when they bring them from birth and acclimate them to put them into the tower. But yeah, they, so there's there's easily like two, three thousand um, actual bodies that are being completely developed illegally. I, I just can't believe that it doesn't it doesn't work for me. I, I really feel like uh, they needed to scale that back a little bit. Now, granted, I, I'm completely with you on there, but I'm going to at least throw it uh, a, a, a little good thing in there. Now, granted, there's no way you'd keep this secret. There's no way everybody working in this facility would just overlook the enormous ethical problems about doing something like this. Especially if they actually know, like, it, it's one thing if some of the support staff thinks this is just all some grand experiment or something. It's any of the support staff toward the end. <laughs> None of them have a conscience at all. Like, mm -hmm. okay. But the part that I did like is when we get introduced to the Tom Lincoln character, the sponsor for Ewan McGregor's character. Um, when we get also played by Ewan McGregor. I got to give him a, a good, nice little personal nod, too. He's an American accent as the clone and in his full Scott um, as the Tom Lincoln. And he transitioned between the two very nicely. It was kind of fun. It was. As far as a a dual role in a, in a, in a movie like this, yeah. they actually, that was a really nice, uh, decision to have the different accents because it wouldn't make any sense for him to have a Scottish accent. No, no. So. But in a lesser film, it just would have been. And getting an actor fully capable of developing ac his accent to, to, to actually bleed off his real accent mm -hmm. and, and speak in American English clearly and not have it even feign it, that, that was good. But what I was going to get to is the Tom Lincoln character in particular as a sponsor, knowing the kind of person who would sign up for this, even if they didn't think that they ever achieved consciousness, that they were just a, a blob of cells that were developing. So you had spare parts when you needed it. Assuming you were OK with that. And the amount of money that you spent to do that and the notion that this is uh, the other thing, the product was also referred to as is a life insurance policy. Mm -hmm. 
if that is your life insurance policy showing up, forgiving all the moral implications of all the staff that didn't say or do anything for these clones, this is not the guy that's going to help the clone. And I liked that that's where they went with that. And I like that he feigned that he wasn't that he was going to be on their side. But ultimately, there was as he even spoke of. And I think at the beginning and whether this was intended or just you and McGregor's delivery or whatever, I, I got the impression when Tom Lincoln first sees his clone and starts to get their story. I think he's legitimately sympathetic in the moment. And then when he starts telling them why he had Lincoln made, and he starts to remember his own mortality, and especially the disease he's suffering from, to which Lincoln is there <laughs> to help him get through, I think that that battle with, the, with his actual demise now starts to overtake that desire to do the right thing. <laughs> so survival takes over ahead of that. I actually love that dynamic. I thought they got that completely right, and I, it, it was great. I would actually say that despite the fact that is uh, directing the ridiculous action scenes and, and having such a difference between the first half and second half of the film mm -hmm. and, you know, and obviously some serious script issues and with uh, issues with, with story elements and things like that, the actors and the acting and how the script is for them, mm -hmm. the dialogue and how they uh, are portrayed are really good. Yes. Uh, with, with few exceptions uh, as far as, again, and that falls more into story because it, okay, you're going to have to do this because that's how we get to the next scene. But the interaction between the actual characters, the motivations with the characters, I think that is actually really good in this mm -hmm. film. Um, they play themselves, uh, Scarlett Johansson, Ewan McGregor, they play themselves like young teenagers. Mm -hmm. I, they said no more than 15, but I would even put them closer to maybe 12 or, or so, but, and maybe that's only because their education perhaps isn't complete. Yes, no, they, they get educated to a 15-year-old's level. It doesn't mean that that's where they were yet. Yeah, no, I actually would put them uh, quite a bit younger mm -hmm. in their sort of the way they thought and their thought processes and how they would see the world and uh, the, the, the naivety and um, the innocence that they portrayed mm -hmm. uh, was was really good. And I loved, I actually really liked the way that Scarlett Johansson could read Echo 6 and could use that to realize something's not right mm -hmm. with Tom Lincoln. Yeah. Something's wrong. His eyes are lying, just like yours. I'm like, Ooh, I like that. <laughs> no, and actually, it begs the question. If raised in a sterile environment with limited things, does a human pick up on other things when it's not distracted by others? Like, that, that, that notion, she's reading. She's reading him. Mm-hmm. Did she develop that because in the environment that they they live in, perception is a big hunk of what they have available, uh, as opposed to endless barrages of TV and movies and internet and all those things. And it's very limited education. They're there mostly to interact with one another, um, stay physically fit and healthy. That's it. That's their mm -hmm. life. So something else they pick up where there is not other things to take away. I did like the uh, the world they structured where they wanted everyone to be friends, mm -hmm. but they didn't want them to get too close. No physical they didn't, touching. They, they didn't want any uh, complications with unwanted pregnancies nope. and things like that. I appreciated that. I like that. It does beg the question, though, there are some women amongst the clones that were being used as breeders right. for couples that apparently couldn't have their own children. How do they explain to those women, the clones, how they get pregnant? Well, <laughs> they, they kind of gloss that over. <laughs> they, they really did. And that would have been something, especially since that was probably one of the more horrific moments that, uh, which was effective 
But yeah, I, the the notion that there are clones there just entirely intended to carry a younger clone to term, um, so that they can, the baby can be given away. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. uh, unless they're actually birthed, quote unquote, pregnant. And they tell them that, that that's how they found them in the outside world. Because they tell everybody as they come in that they were survivors. They were found. And they implant memories uh, as they are gestating, yeah. I guess. Oh, and they also explained uh, that the, uh, the, decon- the decontamination process for those that are saved messes with their heads. Yes, exactly. So, so it's possible that these clone women don't know life without being pregnant. Right. But again, these are elements that the world actually begs further examination of, of all of that. I I thought there was possibility there. And um, interestingly enough, it, it reminds me of another series that did get started. It had nothing to do with clones, but it's called silo. And essentially they live similarly. They're, uh, they're all there to take care of, the silo and they all believe the outside world is contaminated and you don't want to go there. So th- this rung of that. <laughs> uh, I was trying to I always take notes while I watch these films as far as um, what this film got right and what this film yep. got wrong when it came to predicting the future. This was uh, released in 2005. It was predicting, what did I say, 2019? Something like that, yeah. This is probably so far the most fantasy uh <laughs> future that we have seen in any of these films so far the closest thing uh, i think they got to sort of right i mean there were still macintosh computers in uh yeah. <laughs> in the labs okay fine that holds true um the flat screen computer table wasn't too far off from no. some stuff we have you, you you can if you got the money you can get that uh, theirs needed a glass triangle stylus to work. Yeah. <laughs> so, but not quite. But I mean, we use styluses on things too, so not 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 out of whack. But we did not get our hologram Xbox. No, no, we did not. <laughs> so Xbox survived to 2019 in their future. That's that. They did get that right. They got that right, but not quite the format that we uh, we would hope for. The maglev trains didn't come to pass. That one, that one. Well, I think that was a solid prediction that we just can't get going. You can do maglev trains, maybe not quite mm-hmm. like that, but they right. could be done, and we're just not because that's not an investment this world is making. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I think because our uh, our rail system is so well established and you would literally have to go, okay, we're going to change them all over now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you have to uproot them all in order to make any of it effective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can't just have a side-by-side or I don't know if you could somehow retrofit one that wouldn't affect the other. Yeah. And despite our probable need to do so, the U.S. is really not latched on to public transportation as a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. And, of course, uh, we don't have jet bikes. <laughs> no, but while maybe too soon, there are drone-style bikes that are well in development. So In development, no, but I... I I'd be very surprised if anyone in 2005 truly thought we'd have anything like the flying jet bike no. <laughs> in 14 years. <laughs> no, and with my experience with most day-to-day drivers, I don't want the common person on something that flies. <laughs> no, absolutely not. All you're yeah. doing is making missiles. <laughs> That was, as far as technology and things, that's really all I could really pick out of this film. Well, you also missed the the, the glaringly obvious one. Full-scale cloning. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Now, uh, the notion of, uh, at least we can, 3D print some body parts. 
Well, and that's the thing too. Again, this is it's because we wouldn't have a story if you went this way. Even in 2005, we were well on our way to being able to clone and and grow organs sure. without the need of a host body. Right. And that that's the part that really yeah, that's where we're straining is the whole notion you could grow the whole person. Right. Yeah, it doesn't uh, I mean that technology was certainly in its infancy then. It hasn't. It's developed a lot, but it's still not something we're doing now. Certainly, and there's still. I, I'm guessing there are still perhaps uh, people among us with ethical uh, questions about even that. Well, yes, because actually we're getting more into those related to our food sources right now. Mm-hmm. The, the the impossible burgers and, uh, and and such, those are plant-based, but there are actual pieces of meat that they grow. And it's Yeah, meat. I've I have seen uh, I've seen documentaries and stuff about the idea of actually being able to grow a big chunk of beef. Yes. Without having to have a cow, you don't have to feed and care for a cow and slaughter an animal. Which part you can of the just chicken grow, do you want? I or, mean, yeah, we'll you, grow you, that. You, <laughs> exactly. You can grow a big chunk of meat. Yep. I'd be perfectly willing to try that. I'd eat it. I have eaten it. <laughs> oh, there you go. It, it tastes just like the real thing. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no. Uh, but there are those that have ethical concerns over that. So the notion that we would grow an entire human being, um, and I, 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 I well, and you can't have Michael Bay without the military mentioned in some fashion. And they did. They mentioned <laughs> that uh, that basically Pentagon is also mostly funding this, and and yeah, we cause... we found a president that was there <laughs> because the military was actually entertaining the idea of growing a clone army. Yep. Thank you, Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that, I, so yeah, outside of that kind of stuff, it, it was very fan, fantasy-driven. Um, there was no way in hell that we were going to get anything like that in the time frame that they set the film. Well, yeah, and some of it was incongruous because I like that they uh, they included actual real cities with still... They, they, they updated some of the cars, but they were cars. Um, I think I uh, read somewhere that in the original scripts, when, if, when they were first developing the, f- the film or developing the story, they were going to set it like 100 years in the future. And then to kind of curb production costs, they, they, they dialed it back. It back. <laughs> yes. And so I believe some of this stuff may just be hanger-ons from the original premise. And, and that's how that feels. That's why I'm saying, yeah, some of the tech that they've included mixed in, I'm not saying we would rush to revamp every single city and all that, but some of what was there didn't seem like it fit with other things. Do you want to go to some social media stuff? We can do that after I mentioned uh, I still don't believe the 70-story fall. (laughs) When they fell off the side of the building. (laughs) Jesus must love you. I know, right? (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) I I couldn't get away out from the show without mentioning they had a 70-story fall (laughs) while being shot at. (laughs) Not a scratch. I read a brief uh, interview or a quote from Michael Bay that that said even he acknowledges that that was pretty ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I like. Yeah, you had me until you dropped him off of a building and all they did is land in a net and it was okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I did post a social media. They'll be watching it. We got a handful of comments. Uh, I think all came from Facebook. Uh, our friend Steve says he really likes this film. Should probably put it on deck for a rewatch. It seemed like a spiritual successor to Logan's Run, which is a film they always talk about remaking but never happens. I definitely see a little bit of similarities to that as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kevin says, My favorite film. Amazing cast, dark premise, and Scar Jo at 21. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least he's got his priorities. <laughs> Cameron says that it's, 
deaf agreeable and definitely agreeable and speeds along before it runs out of steam. Sean Bean was underused. I, we didn't even mention him and the uh, Sean Bean as the director of the facility. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sean Bean was underused, though, which says a lot for a film that borrowed elements from Westworld, Matrix, Sixth Day, and even an infamous MST3K feature film. <laughs> and no one had mentioned Blade Runner. Mm, yeah, a l- oh, sure. By the idea Blade of Runner the, element in this the replicants. Yep. Yeah, sure. Chris on Facebook, she says, Clonus is the hokey one. <laughs> the island is the Hollywood action one. Never Let Me Go is the depressing one. <laughs> <laughs> so, a few films all in the same theme. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's all we got from on Facebook for the social medias. What did the critics have to say about this film? Yes, the critics. And this was fun reading some of this stuff, too. Uh, so here are some captures. And, and at, toward the top end of, uh, of the good critics is actually Roger Ebert uh, with uh, Chicago Sun-Times at the time. The Island runs 136 minutes, but that's not long for a double feature. (laughs) (laughs) The first half of Michael Bay's new film is a spar, creepy science fiction parable, and then it shifts into a high-tech action picture. Both halves work, whether they work together is a good question. The more you l- like one, the less you may like the other. I like them both to a point, but the movie seemed a little too much like Surf and Turf. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a reason I like Roger. <laughs> he puts it in plain terms, but he's right. The, the, it very much different feels to the first and the second half of this film. New York Times, Dana Stevens, glossy, witty eye candy with some moderately chewy stuff in the middle. This lavish, exhaustingly kinetic film is smarter than you might expect, and at the same time, dumber than it could be. It's an impressive product, a triumph of cloning that almost convinces you that it possesses a soul. I like that. I do. Smarter smarter than you think, dumber than it could be. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I think we touched on all of those points, yep. too. Yeah, she summed it up in a one sentence. Yep, she did. And she did a nice job, Dana. Um, then Boston Globe, Wesley Morris. Bay's, strong, or Bay's strength as a filmmaker, the reason his superficial yet entertaining productions can never be completely ignored is that he appears to lack shame. He'll blow anything up and run anybody over. The moral complexities don't matter to him. He just wants to stage spectacles, appreciate very good-looking people, and assert his cowboy aesthetic. And, yeah, this is why I find it hard that I enjoy this film as much as I do, because Bay's grubby little fingerprints are all over this thing. (laughs) (laughs) And he's the director. I guess they should be, but still. (laughs) Yeah. I I will say, out of the Michael Bay films that I can think off the top of my hand that I have seen, this is probably one of the best cast. Yes. Though. I mean, we we touched on it a little bit earlier, and I don't want to completely you know rewind the show or anything no. but I, I we mentioned the stars the supporting cast itself and it, you know the the other clones the other characters in the facility mm-hmm. were all really good yes no and they and they acted their parts really well no because you could even see the different stages of being a clone in the community right to the one being freshly brought and and while he didn't say anything, his acting like a toddler that didn't understand mm-hmm. was perfect. And, and then you saw people that were in different stages along the way, right? Including the sequence where they're literally reading out loud a children's book. It, it was all good stuff. So, yes, I completely agree. Now let's slip into the little... Believe it or not, those were the good. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. I got a couple of bad here. Entertainment Weekly, Lisa Schwartzbaum. The island begins with a whimper of interest as a cool-hued, 
cautionary exploration of the ethics of cloning and ends in a hail of product placement with a dumb bang. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, yeah, the, the leveling of the facility at the end was a little weird. That There's a serious design flaw <laughs> with their uh, holographic projector there. A little bit, flip, yeah. Like, you turn it off, the fan just disintegrates. You flip one switch... And it makes the fan go fast and fall off its spindle. <laughs> Maybe the Pentagon did pay for that. <laughs> anyway. yeah. uh, and then the last one, and I really, I, I, I need to find this guy a therapist or something. Wall Street Journal, Joe Morgenstern. I'm familiar with him. Yeah. <laughs> Comes on like an overproduced coma and leaves you comatose by the end. In between are 127 minutes of intermittent chaos that that feel like a lifetime. Like, who hurt you, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen this man get... I, I, maybe I need to read more just to get a sense. Does he ever like anything at all, ever? Now, now this is a flawed product. There's plenty to say. But that was a little unfair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Have we... You've read about him on the uh, show before. Has he... Yeah, has he liked anything no, that we've we watched? No, we have never... He, I have never... And if you view Metacritic, for which is where I'll pull a lot of these sources, <laughs> he is always in the red. It always goes green, yellow, red with their, their uh, little rating system based off of the feedback that came from the critics and joe is always in the red so joe my friend if you're out there i'm willing i'm here for you man he's a very critical critic very much it, it's almost like he's charged with the purpose the glorious purpose <laughs> of being the critics critic <laughs> You know, it is one. I see, I can see why you go back and, and catch this every now and again. It, it, yeah, this is not one that I will think, oh, you know what? I'm in the mood to watch. But it's one of those ones where it's just, it's it's the one that if you go back to TV and you're flipping channels mm -hmm. and you happen to see it's on, Yep. I'm going to stop and, and, and watch a few scenes. Maybe I'll finish the film wherever it's at. Yeah, no, like uh, it's thoroughly entertaining to watch them uh, roll the... Uh, the, uh, the 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 railroad wheels off the back of the truck and watch the horrible car collisions that occur as a result. Yeah, it's satisfying. It's fun to watch. Doesn't mean anything in this film. But, no, <laughs> but yeah, I, yeah, I saw somebody comment is like, if all the trains are maglevs, where'd the wheels come from? <laughs> yeah, but someone says maybe they're transported into the scrapyard. That, that, they gotta go somewhere. <laughs> so, no, but that's the point: is you can have some fun at the film's expense for that and enjoy the spectacle of it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, that'll do it for the island. We're gonna take a look at a little bit more of a heavier film. We're gonna look at a film that doesn't have a precise future year that it's set, but it's it's strongly suggested by a, a lot of people that it's post-2020. And we're going to look at 1966 versions of 1966's version of Fahrenheit 451. I know I watched this film at least once. You don't think you've seen it. No, uh, th this will be... And I think I managed to not read the book. Oh, really? Like, it I didn't know come I... up in any of my... Uh, in my high school reading. So... And I hadn't gotten around to it myself. Yeah, that is actually where I've seen the film. Because we read the book in high school. And then my, my teacher, who was prone for doing this kind of stuff, he showed the film sure. uh, afterwards. That, that, so, yeah, uh, I watched this film. It would have been like 1988, <laughs> 87, 88, yeah. sometime in there. Yeah, no, so. But, yeah, so this will be... I, I'm familiar with roughly what the story is because it is so ingrained in culture and ha has fed into so many other things. So I'm familiar with some of the content, but this will be a first watch. 
like I said, this is a little vague on the future, but it is definitely not a a future any further off than we are now. Right. So, I think it. I, I think it will still fit within our theme. Uh, I like it. We'll go with that. Any thoughts on that? Please send them our way, timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com, or follow the link in the show notes to all our social media sites and leave your comments there. I guess that'll do it. Tom, thanks very much. Okay. It's been fun as always. Absolutely. And we'll talk to everybody in a couple weeks. Bye, everybody. See ya.